Hello everyone, welcome back to Probing Paul. This is my monthly Q&A series where I also do mail time, where I open packages that have been sent to my P.O. Box, which will hopefully appear on screen here. In case you didn't know, I have a P.O. Box and thanks to everyone who has sent packages. All the questions I'm answering today were taken from the comment section of the previous video. Also, there are timestamps in the description if you wanna to jump to a specific question. And you know what, just to mix things up today, I'm gonna to do mail time first because I have some very important information to share with you guys about SSD pricing. Today's video is brought to you by Lexar's Thor OC DDR5 memory kits, powering the latest generation of desktop gaming and workstation PCs. Available in speeds up to 6,000 megatransfers per second with CL32 timings, and equipped with both XMP 3.0 and Expo support for Intel or AMD platforms, Lexar Thor OC DDR5 memory provides stability, reliability, and efficiency in a classy and elegant low-profile design. For more on Lexar's Thor OC DDR5 memory kits, click the sponsor link in the video description. So before I start opening packages, a quick PSA about SSD prices. SSD prices are quite good right now. And in fact, back in the middle of the summer, and this article's from June, uh, SSD prices had dropped a lot. They've dropped even more since then. However, more recently, and this is just from the past week or so, Trendforce and some other outlets have indicated that they expect SSD prices to rise. There has been a post-pandemic oversupply of the NAND flash memory chips that SSDs use for storage, which is why prices have come down. However, the manufacturing Manufacturers have cut back on their manufacturing and since storage is often a commodity market prices can go up and go down and you can often predict when prices are going to go up or go down. Now the upward trend of pricing is only expected to be around the 10% range, which means honestly, if you're talking about something like a 40 or a $50 one terabyte SSD, that's only gonna go up in price by maybe five bucks, it's estimated. Likewise, for a $100 drive, it might go up to about 110 or so. So don't like drop everything and pull all the cash out of your savings account and buy SSDs right now. But do note that if you're thinking about buying one, it might be better to buy one sooner or in the month or two leading up to Black Friday versus waiting around. And now I can start opening my packages and full disclosure, quite a few of the packages today I sent myself, which I can do. That is not against the rules of probing Paul. All right, here we go. My first package here is from Amazon and all these are linked in the video's description. Uh, actually contains not an SSD, so a quick aside. When I recently delivered a PC to my sister's family so my nephews could uh, get back to PC gaming, they actually didn't have a direct connection to plug in the internet. So I let them borrow a USB Wi-Fi adapter, but I intended to swap a different one out so I could reclaim mine. I bought this one for them and delivered it actually just a few days ago. I got two of them because I wanted one too. It's supposed to be driverless. I wanted a USB Wi-Fi adapter that Windows like 10 or Windows 11 fresh installs would just recognize. I can't verify that that is the case with this one. It says driver free. However, when my brother-in-law attempted to use it a couple days ago, it was not driver three. It does have Bluetooth integrated and it's just 802.11 AC for up to 600 megabits per second transfer rates. It's been functional for them. I like having an extra USB Wi-Fi adapter on hand, but let's move back to SSD prices. Since this package did include my first SSD, which is a Silicon Power 4 terabyte NVMe SSD, because two terabyte SSDs, they're nice. Four terabyte SSDs are coming down in price and this one's actually currently listed for $170. The cheapest four terabyte NVMe SSDs right now are about 150 bucks. For an extra $20 here, we got a Gen 4 drive that has better read and write speeds. 5,000 and 4,500 megabytes per second reads and writes. And jumping onto PC part picker real quick, just to cross compare, we can see that the price per gigabyte, if you're looking at just SSDs and M.2 2280 SSDs, which are mostly gonna be your NVMe ones, the cheapest options are about uh, 3.5 cents per gigabyte, which gets you a $35 one terabyte drive, about a $70, $71 two terabyte drive, and yes, even about $150 four terabyte drive. And actually this drive was five bucks cheaper like yesterday when I was looking at it, so maybe this is an indication of those price increases that have been rumored. But if we drill down to just the four terabyte drives, we can see that this is still a pretty stinking good deal. In fact, the closest ones by comparison are about $165 to $170 right now. And even though this is a Gen 4 drive with those faster read and write speeds, it's still right around the same price as uh, the cheapest other four terabyte drives that are available. Let me get back to opening stuff because there are too many things to open and I actually don't know what is in what bag. Another one here, which has oh, these adapters. Isn't it, isn't it fun opening packages? More adapters an actual mechanical hard drive. But why, Paul, you might ask, or I assume maybe you're asking, are you buying storage right now? 
Well, when I copy my footage to my main system, I have like a main working drive and then I have a backup 10 terabyte RAID array and then I have external drives and eventually I dump all the stuff to the uh, external drives and I have sort of a procedure I do every so often of backing up that footage because I am somewhat silly and I don't like to delete old footage. However, it does come in useful and I do with some regularity go back to those old drives and pull footage off of them. So I've been steadily filling up a 10 terabyte drive for quite a while and I went to a day or two ago and I realized the drive's pretty much full. I need a new drive, or maybe more than one. So I did what any sensible person who's looking for mass storage at a cheap price should do other than clicking the links in this video's description, by the way, which was heading over to PC Part Picker and going to their storage thing and basically sorting by price per gigabyte. And here we can see that whereas SSD prices are still gonna cost about 3.5 cents per gigabyte at the cheapest, mechanical drives are still maintaining their relevancy by bringing that price down to even one cent per gigabyte if you look at this Seagate Enterprise six terabyte drive right here. Now the drive I actually decided to purchase was this one, a WD 14 terabyte Ultrastar, which is um, from their enterprise or data center line, which usually means they're overbuilt. They're probably gonna last a little bit longer. And this drive was down to like 165 or $170, which was a really good price per gigabyte, but the shipping was gonna take like two weeks. So I have ordered this drive, but it hasn't arrived yet because I wanted something sooner though, and also something uh, ostensibly to show you guys in this video. I went ahead and ordered another drive, a Seagate six terabyte, and you can see actually even for the enterprise that drives down here, like a Seagate Enterprise 6 terabyte drive or this ST6000, whatever, are right around one cent, maybe 1.2 cents per gigabyte. Enterprise drives, as long as they're still SATA, will plug right into a desktop system just fine. And again, enterprise drives, data center drives are typically overbuilt more so than your cheapest desktop drives made for consumers. So they're probably gonna be a little bit more reliable long-term. And even this drive has gone back up. It's 75 bucks now versus $70 that I bought it for yesterday. It, they must just be watching this video as I film it and increasing the prices of things in real time because uh, PC Part Picker has that at 60. Uh, actually, it's 80 bucks. Yeah, so I guess my drive, uh, even though the price has gone up by five bucks, still seems to be the best price per gigabyte for a mechanical drive right now. But it is nice to see some higher capacity drives on this list too with like 14 and 20 terabyte models that are going for about 1.4 cents per gigabyte. All right, other items here are, uh, they're, they're not like reader. Well, one of them's a reader and then we have a couple enclosures. What I realized recently is that I, I use external drives pretty frequently. I also have a network set up and everything that I do transfers with, but I still end up using external drives quite often. And this is a device that if I thought about it, I would figure, yeah, this probably exists. I just never tried to hunt one down. Uh, this is kind of like a toaster. Toaster is kind of the informal name that I and several friends uh, have given to those external drive docks for 3.5 inch drives that you can take a 3.5 inch drive and drop down into. I've done a video on the one I used before, but this is like a toaster for M.2 drives. So it has a little slot on top there that you can just slot in an M.2 drive it has a USB type C connector, of course, and it even has a SATA connector as well. So I don't think this is gonna be able to provide enough power to spin up like a 3.5 inch mechanical drive, but for SATA SSDs, I should be able to plug this in and uh, connect those up too, which is mainly just a point of convenience. I mostly got this because I wanted a quick way if I have M.2 drives, like if I have an old test bench or something and I need to pull something off of it, I can just pop this in rather than like getting the test bench back up and running. Also for drive cloning and stuff like that, I think this is gonna be very useful. It's also USB 3.2, 10 gigabits per second. So you're not gonna be able to max out these M.2 NVMe SSDs, but you are gonna be able to transfer stuff a lot faster than you would older versions of USB. The cable it comes with actually has two USB type A plugs, so you can plug into two USB headers to get more power if you're plugging in a drive that requires more power. And it comes with a little USB type C to A adapter as well for ease of connectivity. I also wanted to get a couple external drives up and running that were gonna be a little bit more like long-term use versus something that I might install multiple M.2 NVMe SSDs for that. So I got both of these. Now this SSK model here is the one that I purchased first. And this is a USB 3.2 Gen 2 drive, which is up to 10 gigabits per second. Comes with a little mounting tool, a bit of thermal pad there. And uh, here's the actual enclosure itself. Nice and slim, not too bad. But again, USB 3.2 Gen 2, 
10 gigabits per second. Real world is gonna give you like about one gigabyte per second, 1000 megabytes per second transfer speeds. And of course, we know that in NVMe SSDs, the Gen 3 ones can go up to like 2000 or 3000 megabytes per second transfer speeds. And the Gen 4 ones can do like 4000, 5000 or above that. So if you're taking one of these kinds of drives and installing it into one of these enclosures, you're actually gonna be pretty severely limiting the drives like maximum throughput, which is why when I was searching for SSDs, my first inclination was to get a fast four terabyte model. But then I also wanted to find sort of a, a mediocre PCIe 3.0 drive to put in the enclosure that wouldn't be like cutting back on its re read and write speeds too much. However, SSD prices are so good that the prices for those faster drives are pretty much in parity with the slower drives. So you might as well just buy the faster drive anyway. This is a two terabyte drive that I have also ordered, but it hasn't arrived yet. Two terabytes for $70. And again, I was looking for one of those sort of entry level gen three drives. that's maybe in the 1500 to 2000 megabytes per second read and writes range, but it's the same price to get one that's faster. So I just got this one. Now the benefit of the USB 3.2 Gen 2 uh, external enclosures like this one is they can be found fairly cheap. This one is only about 16 or 17 dollars. But if you do want one that's at least going to get a little bit closer to the drive's actual read and write speeds, you want a 3.2 Gen 2 by 2 uh, uh, SSD, which is this one right here. Uh. Very wedged in there. Now this one's made by Orico and uh, they have a few different models that seem to have, be based on the same controller, but these have aluminum housings that actually are designed to do a little bit more heat dissipation because if you are installing a higher end NVMe drive into one of these, they can get hot. Not this one necessarily, but the fastest uh, SSDs can, and they can require some cooling, sometimes even active. They have uh, enclosures that actually have a fan included too. But this is the one I decided to get. Again, USB 3.2 Gen 2 by two on the end, and it should say specifically that it's capable of 20 gigabits per second. Now going from 10 gigabit to 20 gigabit isn't quite gonna double your actual throughput. You're gonna go from about a thousand megabytes per second reads and writes to about 1800-ish megabytes per second reads and writes. Still, that's taking advantage of a lot more speed of the SSD by going with the higher end drive, but of course they cost more money. This one was about 50 bucks instead of about 15 or 20. But there you have it, a new collection of storage devices for me. I'm gonna start making use of these as soon as possible. Moving on, we have a couple letters that were sent over, stuff that I didn't order for myself. This one's from Jason C, who uh, is pretty local here from Fullerton. Oh, hey, look at that. That's a, that's a DoorDash card right there. Jason says, <laughs> of course, Jason's local. He was at the fan meetup and he sent a very kind letter thanking us for the fan meetup, apologizing because his kid tore the QR code that I had set up there. It was fine, Jason, no worries. That was such a good meetup. And Jason sent a DoorDash over, which is, that, that's so awesome. Thank you, Jason. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate the kind words. Uh, we will now be able to not cook dinner at home one night this week. So my wife also thanks you. Next letter was sent by Michael P from Oregon. And let's see what Michael has to say. Michael finished the letter by saying, thank you for enduring my chicken scratch handwriting. Uh, this is just another like super positive, very heartwarming letter about how Michael uh, likes the content. He likes the Probing Paul segments, uh, the personal updates and stuff that I've been doing along the way, provides some personal advice for me, some suggestions, which I also appreciate. So, but Michael, thank you very, very much for sending this letter over. I really appreciate the kind words and it's totally brightened my day. And now we have an actual box. This one's from Ruben M, who is from Maine. So this one came all the way across the country. Ruben also, uh, after sending this to me, uh, sent me a tweet over on Twitter and said, hey, check your PO box. So if you guys send something to my PO box uh, and you wanna send me a heads up as well, I really appreciate that. Okay, what do we got here? So first off, we have a printout here, and this is something I'm totally happy to share with you guys, and I will also add this link to the video's description. Extra Life, you guys might be familiar with. We do Extra Life charity events every year. We have one planned coming up in December. But of course, lots of people do Extra Life, and this one is for the BBCH, the Barbara Bush Children's Hospital. Extra Life connects gamers with a local children's hospital, the Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. They have a gaming PC giveaway, which appears to be going on right now. Yes, it looks like it's open until November 7th, so you guys can still enter. So uh, if you guys are interested, links in the description. Head over there and help support Extra Life. I highly recommend it. Thank you, Ruben, for the heads up on that one. Ruben included a lot of material here, so I can't read all of it, but just, uh, again, some very kind words expressing the appreciation for the content I make and also somewhat apologizing for sending me something that confused me before which is this mug right here, which I opened on a previous episode of Probing Paul, and I was very confused. It says, I've been told we're very excited on the back, and then there's a picture, I believe, of Ruben, not with a cat face swap with his cat, but Ruben has a cat face too, along with the cat. 
that was sent with pretty much zero context. So Joe and I were pretty baffled by what the heck it actually was. And is, is this another one? Do we have one for Joe now too? Oh, no, it's, it's another entry in the Lion of Reuben mugs. And this also explains the other thing that he sent over, which we were confused about too, because there was no context. We thought it was a picture of, of Gabe Newell, but that's actually Reuben relaxing by the fireplace. There's Reuben, it looks like at a gaming event. He's got a Half-Life 3 shirt on, which looks pretty awesome. We have been mugged even more. And then Reuben also included uh, just a, a pretty wide selection of candy. Oh, wow. Pink wrapping, oh my goodness. Freeze dried treats from Maine, made by For Science, which is a pretty cool name for a candy making company. Look at all the colors. I'm assuming I can share these with my daughter, right? Like these are, these are just normal candies. Some of them don't have labels on them. But Ruben is nothing if not trustworthy. At least that's the impression I've gotten of him so far. Ruben, thank you so much for sending me multiple packages over the past years. Some of them were slightly confusing, but all of them have been very delightful. And this one, absolutely not the least. So, uh, candy. I love candy. And now to answer some questions. I'm gonna try to do this as fast as possible because I feel like this video is already too long. The first one's from Koi Kimono. Hey Paul, love your chill tech videos. Thank you very much. A good question is uh, how is the home setup doing for the first month? It's actually closer to two months now, I think, since this question was asked. The answer is good, quite good. I'm super, super happy with my decision and the change and the shift and everything. And making videos here has been super easy since I've been back home. The flip side to that is that I ran out of time. We got into a couple launches that I did some benchmark videos for, I did a couple builds. So I've gotten back into like making videos here, but I only got sort of the basic basic functional setup going. I still have a bunch of organizing to do. So I'm gonna be doing some more work on that in the next week or two. Also, I've posted three videos on sort of that whole process so far. And I was intending to post one of those a week or one every two weeks, but I sensed interest starting to fall off and I was being a little bit too detailed going only like one or two weeks at a time. So I have another one coming that should go up this week. And I'm gonna take a lot of that footage I have for a longer period of time, like a month or a month and a half and consolidate that all down. So you can see a lot of stuff happening at once. And there's a little bit less focus focus on the minutia. And then I'm gonna have a sort of phase two setup in here where I actually like wall mount my desks, where I do a bunch of cable management that hasn't been done yet. And of course handle some minor things like putting the doors back on my cupboard over here, wrapping up that, that exhaust vent thing that's up in the corner that always looks kind of gross. And maybe actually securing the top of the sit stand desk over there with screws. Right now it's just like literally set on top. Next question from Alpine Stars. Uh, it's about the RTX 4090 and the 12 VH power cable issue, which has been a bit of a dramatic thing over the past, I don't know, one or two years even. Question is, is this still even an issue and has the new standard fixed the melting issue? So first off, the new version of the connector is called 12V 2x6 instead of 12VH power. This was published back in July. Here's a side view. Uh, these are like the power pins up here and this is the sense pin down here. As, it, as you can see, it's pretty long. So the sense pin would connect and make contact before the power pins. This is the original 12VH power connector. And then here we have the updated version and you can see the sense pins are shorter. And even though they're still a little bit longer than the connecting pins in there, the idea here is that the sense pins won't make contact while these pins have limited or poor contact or no contact at all. And unless those sense pins sense that they're connected, it's not gonna provide the power, which should prevent or at least reduce the potential for those melting connector problems. But because the 12VH power issue got so much media attention, even small problems that have cropped up since then have gotten, I think, a lot more media attention than they would have otherwise. So even though there have still been reports of melted connectors that have happened in the past six months or a year, they've been way, way, way cut down. And I think that's partially because of hardware updates. And I think it's partially because people have been made more aware of the issue. Jay just recently did an update video on the cable mod 12VH power adapters because they made those and it was supposed to be a solution, but then even some of those had melted, so they've updated that design too. At this point, I don't see it to be a major problem or a major point of concern. Uh, I wouldn't say stay away from the RTX 4090 because of this issue for sure. Like just make sure that if you do buy an RTX 4090, maybe consider getting a power supply that you know has the updated 12V two by six connector versus the old style connector. And then make sure when you're plugging in the connector that it's seated all the way and that you don't have any excess strain on the cables pulling it down or to one side or the other, and you should be just fine. Next question from C Protocol. Uh, I hope the move goes well, thank you. If you had to choose one part of the PC to be the only part that you talk about on only one, which would you choose? Which one fascinates you the most? Uh, I found this to be an interesting question. It made me think. My first thought was 
GPUs, graphics cards, but honestly that's because GPUs probably get the most media attention these days because there have been a lot of advances there and there's always a lot of discussion to be had there because of like Nvidia's pricing shenanigans or like AMD's most recent moves in the space or Intel like getting in with their Arc series as well. However, and maybe this is just me being contrary, but I don't think that would be my answer. I would actually veer towards the motherboard because the motherboard I think can be something of an overlooked part. The motherboard often gets blamed for PC problems, but functionally the motherboard does so many things for your computer and it ties everything together. And there's so many different parts of a motherboard that do different things, different form factors and different configurations that you can do with them. So yeah, I'm gonna go with the motherboard. If you guys feel differently, then let me know in the comments section down below. Last question here from Mr. McGreed, a longtime watcher, a frequent commenter. Thank you, Mr. McGreed, for all of your support. Jay recently described himself as the Walmart greeter of tech YouTubers. GN Steve is maybe a warehouse manager, and maybe I am the gateway drug. But the actual question here is what or who influenced your taste in music? Uh, I think for a lot of people, the music that you start listening to like uh, in your teenage years often becomes sort of a seminal part of your, of your character or who you are or just the music that you like. So for me, that means like grunge music. Uh, and I guess there was also a ska trend at the time when I was in high school, which I feel like is kind of coming back. I've been hearing some more ska stuff recently. I guess I could say my dad, who has always been a big fan of Paul Simon, and we would listen to Paul Simon music like going on family trips and stuff. And I'm a huge Paul Simon fan. And I'm thinking of more and more things here because I try to maintain a pretty broad appreciation for music, like anything from like jazz, classical, rap, like e even some country I throw in there, like some Brad Paisley, I like Brad Paisley. But I guess I can say this to kind of summarize. A lot of music I feel like is, is kind of manufactured to meet sort of the pop criteria to get popular and sell stuff and make money for the music industry. I very much appreciate the artists who can take a thought or a feeling or a story and like put that into words and make the words rhyme or fit to music. I feel like there's an immense amount of skill and talent that goes into crafting something like that. That's not just something that sounds good or just using a lot of conventions and sounds that are currently popular, but actually taking something that is heartfelt, that is real and that is true and putting that into music. I, I just find that to be such an incredible thing to be able to do. It's something that I've always wanted to be able to do myself, but not everyone has that talent. But oh my gosh, what a difficult question to end this video on when I'm trying to wrap things up quickly because there's so many different facets to that answer. But hopefully it gives you guys a better idea of my musical tastes, my recommendations for SSDs, answers to several other questions. And of course, if you have a question that you'd like me to answer in the next episode of Probing Paul, leave that in the comments section down below. Check the video description for links to stuff that I talked about today. Thank you to all the people who have asked me questions and all the people who sent me stuff. Again, the PO box is listed down in the description too. Check out my store at paulshardware.net for shirts, mugs, pint glasses, other high quality merchandise you can buy to help support the channel. Thanks again everyone for watching and we'll see you in the next video.